Hey folks, it's Planetary I am here with a commentary on what is now the most popular video on my channel, the Scary Stories from the Railway series video. This is where I go into detail about some of the more unusual stories from Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends' literary origins. I noticed on YouTube there were videos regarding the scary stories from the Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends TV show made by people like Dorkley and Phantom Strider, and I just wanted to put my own spin on it by discussing stories from the original book series that were of the same nature. I should point out that I never had any intentions going into this of bashing Thomas and Friends or any of the fan base. I have nothing against Thomas and Friends fans. In fact, if it weren't for the, some of them, I probably never could have done all the research I needed to do to make this video. So, in a way, I owe it to them. And I gotta say, this was quite an interesting one to research. Anyway, after this long intro, we're gonna get started with the actual video with the sad story of Henry, or Henry's tragic tale, as I've referred to it here. This is the story that I find is commonly brought up as an example of how the original Railway series is less than kid-friendly, and how Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends tries to scare little kids, which I don't agree with in any sense at all. I... oh title got cut off too soon there. I think there are a lot of cases in classic children's literature where minor misdeeds are met with cruel and unusual punishment for consequences. Not just in the Railway series, like also in uh, Peter Rabbit or in Grimm's Fairy Tales. These stories are trying to get across the message that disobedience leads to serious consequences. They're just doing it in a rather drastic way. The soft piano music I have playing in the background here, that's actually a Vince Garaldi tune called Rain, Rain, Go Away. It's from a Peanuts soundtrack album. Vince Garaldi was the guy who composed the musical scores for the first dozen or so Peanuts specials. I think his music is also fitting for Thomas and Friends. I could see cases where it could be used, but Joe Cool's theme could probably be used for James, for instance. <laughs> and now poor old Henry is bricked into the tunnel for always and always and always, as Sir Topham Hatt says. And we end the story with saying, I think he deserved his punishment. Don't you? It was one of those other scary Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends story videos I watched where I believe it was Dorkley who made the connection between the sad story of Henry and the cask of Amontillado. I remember reading that story and I never thought to make the connection. I, I don't know if that story inspired the Reverend Audrey to come up with Henry's punishment in that way, but it's an interesting coincidence. Yeah, this was one of the original tales the Reverend told to his son Christopher when he was ill in bed with the measles. I read that these tales were told to amuse his son, so I assume Christopher Audrey wasn't frightened in any way by this story when it was first read to him. Oh yeah, and Henry does eventually get out of the tunnel. I think someone in the comments said it was like a year after he had been bricked up that he got out, which, given the cobwebs on him, I can believe that. <laughs> and yeah, he and Edward pull the train Gordon couldn't pull, and then Henry is painted blue at the end of the book, which I think was a mistake on the Reverend's part, because as he's illustrated, Henry is similar in shape to Gordon, so coloring him blue is only going to make things confusing. Of course, the illustrator the Reverend was working with at this time didn't have the Reverend's flair for technical accuracy, so maybe he's more to blame than the Reverend was. Either way, I think Henry looks better in green and it makes him more distinguished. Alright, now we're coming to the part of the video people get on my case the most about. Oh, before I go there, the small railway engines. So, these guys actually did make it to the television series when it went all CGI. I think it was for, like, a railway series celebration that they had them debut in a movie, and then they adapted the stories from the small railway engines book. <laughs> 
I can tell why they didn't put them in the model series, because if you look at how small the narrow gauge engines are in comparison to Thomas and his friends, and then consider that the small railway engines are half their size, I think it would have required, like, nanotechnology to build models of the small railway engines, or maybe bigger scale models of everything else. Either way, it would have been too expensive. So, I can understand why they skipped those stories in the model series years. And, um, Scarlo talks about Scarlo's real-life twin, Tally Lynn, illustrated without a face. I think it was the Reverend's unwritten rule that engines who existed in real life would be illustrated without faces. Or maybe it's that if they were on the mainland and not Sodor, they'd be illustrated without faces. I can't remember which. Oh, the Peanuts soundtrack music is there again. Maybe not the greatest choice of tune for this scene, but I really didn't know what else to put there. I didn't want to use too many of the Thomas themes here, just to avoid being redundant. You know, everybody uses those. Yeah, and there's my little Instagram joke that nobody laughed at. Okay, now, this part here coming up is what I think got a few people irritated with me. The part where Sir Handel pretends to be ill to get out of doing the TV show, but then Controller tells him, driver and farming shall take you to pieces. That will make a very interesting picture. Wow. Yeah, maybe That's this a was a bit of an overreaction on my part. It's just, it sounded excessive to me when I first heard it, like kind of an invasion of Sir Handel's privacy, and yet another over-the-top punishment for an engine's misdeeds. Of course, that was what the sad story of Henry had happened to. And yeah, I tried to illustrate how I feel that situation would go down if it happened with real people in this great imagined segment which showcases my amazing skills with MS Paint and my little drawing pad. <laughs> I forgot to draw the backgrounds. I used a Huey on H420 tablet to make these scenes. It's not the greatest apparatus for animation. It serves though. Yeah, Back to Sir Handel Sir in Handel this story, so I know he should have known better. He pulled the stunt in the first story of the book, he got out of shunting by playing ill, which led Peter Sam to do his work. Peter Sam had an accident at the incline by some trucks who thought he was Sir Handel, so Sir Handel was indirectly at fault for what happened to Peter Sam. And the Thin Controller punished Sir Handel for what he did in that story, so Sir Handel really should have learned his lesson by this time. Even so, I think this is one of those railway series stories that's better left in its literary form. That said, let's move on to the next segment in the video, which I feel is one of the better parts of it. The troublesome, troublesome trucks. trucks. Yeah, as annoying as these guys were, they provided much of the entertainment factor for the series, both the railway series and the television series. Yeah, they were a source of conflict and a source of the action in the railway series and the show. The accidents, yeah, everybody loves the accidents in the television show. There's a reason why that accidents will happen video. It's a Thomas and Friends music video which showcased all the accidents that happened up to that point in the show. There's a reason that video is so popular, because everybody loves the train crashes, especially the ones that happened during the years of the model series. Oh yeah, Donald and Douglas are cool. I feel like they work best when they're reacting to the antics of the other characters. For example, when Duck goes on and on to Donald about his branch line, Donald tells him he sounds like he's quacked as if he's laid an egg. That's how I feel Donald and Douglas work best, sort of as foil characters, if that's the right term. That's not to say they don't have any good stories of their own, like this one, Break Van. I love the way Ringo says Donald's line here. Ringo Starr was probably my favorite narrator for the show. I know he didn't really give each character their own distinct voice, technically, but he provided the drama and the tone for the series, so I like him for that. 
Oh, bit of trivia. So this break van episode, there was supposed to be an episode before it based off the first two stories from the Twin Engines book. It was called The Missing Coach. Uh, Britt Allcroft, the showrunner at the time, cut it from production when it was about halfway done, saying the plot would have been too complicated for kids to understand. I can kind of tell why she made that decision. The resolution to that story in the book kind of threw me a little bit. Somebody found uh, pictures from the episode's production and put them up online so you can see for yourself how far along it was in production before they dropped it. And here we're about to witness our first instance of rolling stock carnage. Yep. Wait for it. Wait for it. And... There we go. The van was in pieces. Something I didn't realize for the longest time was that the title of this story, Break Van, is actually a play on words. Because the way that break is spelled in the title of this story is the way you would spell the word break as in if you break a dish. So, yeah, you know, the Reverend Audrey hit a rather clever pun in the title here with how it resolved. And in the next story, Donald and Douglas worry that they're going to be sent away after all of what's happened throughout this book. But the other engines are sympathetic, so they form a deputation, and Donald and Douglas go on to become permanent members of the Fat Controllers Railway. Yeah. Adios, Mr. Brake Van. Alright, now time for another story featuring the demise of a piece of rolling stock. Okay, so Oliver was pushed into the turntable well by the trucks, and that story was adapted for the television series in its third season. This story, Toad Stands By, was adapted in the fourth season, and it's supposed to directly follow that one. Yeah, that was kind of one of the annoying things about the television show, was the way they sequenced the adaptations. Not all the Railway series stories necessarily need to be told in strict chronological order, but there are exceptions to that, like this story. And I think there was one more story like that, it was where Gordon takes the Queen. That was supposed to take place after Thomas fell down the mine and Gordon rescued him. That story was from season one, but the story where Gordon uh, takes the Queen was in season four. And it's just awkward. The way that episode began was with Gordon taking Thomas home after rescuing him from the mine, and then Thomas saying, I hope the fat controller forgives us soon. I'm just like, if it's been three seasons by now and he still hasn't forgiven you, I wouldn't hold my breath. But enough about that, it's time to witness the death of a freight car. <laughs> and Duck's enjoying every minute of this. <laughs> It's like a medieval torture rack, if you think about it. I'm coming apart. Oh! Yeah, that'll leave a scar. Physically for Scruffy and mentally for the rest of the trucks. The effect was much more dramatic in the books because it said that Scruffy's front end was literally bumping behind Oliver as he shot forward. I don't know if they couldn't film it that way in the TV series because they weren't capable of doing it or because they thought it was too graphic. Either way, the spectacle is just as amazing in there. I wonder, when they were filming that scene for the model series where Oliver pulls Scruffy apart, did the model provide the force necessary to perform that effect, or did they have some crew member off-screen pulling Scruffy apart with string in addition to Oliver's model pulling him one way and the trucks pulling him the other way? Oh, the mysteries of the behind-the-scenes work on the model years of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. And I also have to wonder, with the amount of accidents that occur on the island of Sodor, what are the Fat Controller's insurance rates like? Is he, like, on the verge of bankruptcy because of all of what happens with his engines when things go wrong with the trains they pull? I'm giving fan fiction writers too much material to work with here. Maybe we'll just call that one of the unanswerable questions of this series. Ah, the mountain engines now. These guys never showed up in the TV show, but they did make toys of them. Um, 
I believe it was the die-cast range and the wooden railway had uh, the mountain engines made into toys. Maybe it was something else. I know they had die-cast models of the mountain engines made, because that range expanded beyond the television series and made models of the railway series characters. It's pretty cool, actually, but those die-cast models are long discontinued. I think they go for, like, ridiculous amounts of money on eBay. I had a lot of the die-cast models and the wooden models of Thomas and Friends. I don't think I ever had the mountain engines, or any of the narrow-gauge engines for that matter, but I still have them. I think they're somewhere up in my parents' attic. Oh, uh, yeah, Duncan. If you guys have ever seen that George Carlin dubbing Thomas the Tank Engine series where someone takes bits and pieces from George Carlin's audiobooks and adds them into the episodes of Thomas and Friends that he's narrated, the segments that have Duncan in them are so fitting it's hilarious. Yeah, you know who's about to get more than he bargained for where comeuppance is concerned in this story. Uh, and here I go again with engines feeling violated because the people take them apart. I understand that maintenance is part of what keeps locomotives going, and sentient locomotives are no exception, so the engines are probably used to being taken apart for that. It's just the way that they say it, taken to pieces, is kind of over the top to me. Speaking of over the top, Godred has now plunged to his inevitable demise. Yeah, there weren't a lot of photographs or things I could find here. I wanted to use footage from a fan-made video of the story. Someone reenacted this event with uh, their die-cast models. Unfortunately, I couldn't get permission to use that, so I had to make do with photographs I found on the TTTE Wikia and other sources. A site I wanted to use during production on this video was a site called The Real Lives of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends. It basically goes into all the stories and their real-life inspirations. I wanted to use that, but I could not get the links to work on that site. I just kept getting redirected to the homepage each time I tried to click on something. I later learned after I posted the video that that site had changed domains, which is why the links weren't working. So, yeah, that was a major drag that I didn't find that out earlier. Fortunately, I had my copy of the Thomas the Tank Engine Man, as well as the TTTE Wikia, to help me out some in making this video. <laughs> Henry with a therapist. I think of all the fat controllers' engines, Henry would probably be the one most in need of psychiatric help. But will Sir Topham Hatt give it to him? No. Besides, Henry's too big to sit on a couch. Oh yeah, and the mountain engines had a face on their backsides as well as their fronts. I think they were designed that way so we could determine what mood the engines were in when they were pushing something up the mountainside. That's the way the mountain engines were usually depicted, um, pushing coaches rather than pulling them like most other engines do. It does make them look rather odd. But I think some of the diesels were illustrated that way too, like at least Boko was illustrated having a face at both ends. So the mountain engines weren't terribly unusual in that regard. And not much more than 10 seconds after I mentioned diesels, we come to this segment. Yeah, the Reverend Audrey based pretty much all the stories he wrote on real-life events that happened on some railway around the world. That Real Lives of Thomas the Tank Engine and Friends website I mentioned has a real stories database where you can look up uh, the events that inspired each story that the Reverend wrote. Percy looks different here because this illustration comes from a later book. 
there weren't any alternate illustrations for the first scene from this book, so I had to kind of fudge things a bit. But now this illustration, quite a depressing one, with two engines in the scrapyard. This kind of reminds me of another story I read when I was little. The author and illustrator of the book, his name was Bill Pete. I forgot what the story's title was, but it was about a steam locomotive that somehow wound up in a river, and at one point you see two engines, steam engines, out in the field. Um, I don't know if they were ready for the scrapyard. I can't remember what the title of the book was, but the author and illustrator's name was Bill Pete. Bill Pete was not only a children's book writer and illustrator, he also was an animator. He worked with Walt Disney, actually. If you guys are interested, go check out uh, Bill Pete's autobiography. He had quite an interesting career history. Yeah, just giving a shout out to another great children's book author and illustrator. Back to these stories here. The Railway series comes under a lot of fire for not being politically correct enough, being racist, authoritarian, sexist, what have you. There were at least two articles like this one that I ran across in doing research. Supposedly they're by these concerned moms who think the series is a negative influence on their kids, which is far and away from my own opinions on these books. I think they're good stories. They do have a few dark moments in them, but that doesn't mean I think they're bad. I think good kids' stories, as I've said before, don't, you know, sugarcoat the bad things, but show that good can come out of those situations. Like here, with the introduction of the Bluebell Railway. Yeah, there's a fine line between doing an honest critique of a piece of children's literature and being a closed-minded harpy who sees everything as offensive that doesn't fly with your worldview. I tried to be as objective as possible in doing the research for this video and producing it, so I find it rather jarring that people lump me into the same category as the people who wrote those articles. I certainly don't object to the content of these books. I mean, sure, there are a few jarring instances in them, but it's nothing that I think is objectionable for kids. Nothing that's psychologically scarring or emotionally damaging in these books, or in the TV show for that matter. Oh yeah, for the TV show, the showrunners basically made up an episode where Rusty, the narrow-gauge diesel, goes all the way to the mainland to rescue Stepney so he can run the Bluebell Railway. I assume they did that just because they wanted to present something more exciting than what happened in the original story from the book. They kind of did that when adapting the second story from the book as well. They gave Thomas a bit of a bigger role and omitted the part where Stepney was talking to Edward about all the other engines on the Bluebell Railway. It was still technically an adaptation of the original story, it's just quite a few things were changed in it. But I've gone on long enough about Stepney the Bluebell Engine, let's talk about this book, Enterprising Engines. The first story, I admit, isn't really a scary one, but I felt like it wouldn't be right to not include it. It introduces us to some pretty dark themes that were present in this book. This was published at the time steam was abolished on British railways, and it illustrates some of the grim effects that had. Like Gordon here learning that all but one of his brothers has been scrapped. I was tempted to make an all of my friends are dead meme reference here, but I knew that given the mood of the scene that wouldn't be appropriate and it would have killed the tone of this part here. Yeah, jokes don't really work when you're trying to convey a serious scene. The old Lang Syne tune on harmonica really captures the tone of this scene. Now, I think that most of the locomotives who served as the bases for the Railway Series characters are still in existence. I've seen engines like Duck Around, and the Snowden Mountain Railway engines, who the Caldy Fell engines are based on, are still working, I assume. I'm pretty sure there are no steam trams still in existence. Uh, Toby's basis has gone the way of the Dodo and become extinct, sadly. 
And now Sir Topham Hatt gets the idea to surprise Gordon with a visit from Flying Scotsman. If my research is correct, Flying Scotsman was supposed to appear in the original model version of the TV series, but due to budget constraints they could only afford to build his tenders, so the episode basically just had Gordon seeing Flying Scotsman's tenders sticking out of the shed and thinking he needed two of them because of what James and Duck were saying about him needing so much coal and water, respectively. I admit, the original story from the book is better, but that is still a pretty good episode, actually. Yeah, as strict and uptight as the fat controller is, I don't really see him as a villain. He's sort of a father figure to them, which is how I think the Reverend Audrey wanted him to be presented. Change of subject here, this story, Super Rescue, was not adapted for the television series. The story sees Henry coming to the rescue of two failed diesels, despite him not being in proper running condition himself due to his regulator being jammed wide open. Now, if my rudimentary knowledge of steam engines is correct, I believe the regulator is what controls the flow of steam to an engine's pistons and allows the train to be driven. My question is, when the regulator is jammed wide open, what effect does that have on Henry? Is he, like, leaking steam more than normal, or is it harder for his driver to control his speed? Yeah, those of you who are better versed in the knowledge of steam engines, could you please clarify that for me? That looks like it'd be fun to two engines with freight cars in front of them and then have them collide head-on with each other. But it probably would be pretty dangerous in real life, so kids don't do that at home. Yeah, that was the best shot I could find of number two. There was no full illustration of him in the books. I think that might have been one of the reasons why uh, the TV series just used Reneas's model with a different face and color to portray the engine Duke spoke about to Stuart and Falcon to get them to behave. They might have also done it for budgetary reasons. I'm not really sure. Yeah. Someone pointed out that if you look closely at number two behind the brick wall, you can see a cigarette on the ledge and a mustache underneath his nose. I don't know if the illustrator had a specific person in mind when designing the face for that scene, but either way, it's quite a jab at us Americans. I'm not sure, but I feel like the Reverend Audrey might have had a bit of a prejudice against Americans. I read somewhere that Andrew Lloyd Webber was thinking of making the Railway series into a musical, and he wanted full rights to the books so he could get money from American investors. The Reverend balked at the idea, saying once the Americans get a hold of it, the entire series will be vulgarized and ruined. Harsh as that criticism is, from what I've seen of the most recent seasons of Thomas and Friends, now that Mattel owns it, it looks like garbage. It looks tacky and childish, completely the opposite of what the Reverend had originally done for us more than 70 years ago. I'm sorry to those of you who are fans of the Thomas and Friends TV series, but if I ever do another review of the show, it's probably going to be something related to the classic seasons from the model years, seasons one to however many that was. Those have at least some dignity to them. Oh, this book, um, The Island of Sodor, it's People, History, and Railways. I couldn't actually find a copy of that. I think it's been out of print for more than 30 years now. Most of what's in it I found on the TTTE Wikia site, including the fact that number two's real name was Stanley. I believe someone pointed out that there was a Stanley in the Thomas and Friends TV series, but that's a completely different character, I'm sure. Not a character of the Reverend's creation. Moral of story, as long as you're obnoxious and inconsiderate, you'll always... And I end this video on a poop joke. Aren't I just fantastic? So that about wraps up my commentary on my Scary Stories from the Railway series video. 
I'm glad a lot of people liked it. I'll talk about Christopher Audrey's stories briefly here. I read through some of them, and they're okay. I feel like he kind of wound up repeating some of the situations that happened in his father's stories in some cases. The story of Bullstrode, which was illustrated there, was one example of a dramatic story from the younger Audrey's pen, but there wasn't anything quite like Bad Lookout, or Toad Stands By in Christopher Audrey's Railway series. Not that I'm aware of, anyway. Quite interesting to research this video, it was. I've suddenly become Yoda now. Better stop talking, I must, and end this video soon. See you guys.